But with Dali, it was love at first sight. And over the summer, they grew ever closer. So much so that she left her husband and child to be with Dali. Gala became Dali's muse and manager. Over the years, she appeared in more than 50 of his paintings. She has been described as part tiger, part martyr, part mother, part mistress, and part banker. This is Dali's studio. And what an amazing space. You can see immediately, look at these enormous windows just letting in all of this beautiful Port Legat light. He just had to look out the window and he'd see this view, which almost was like a ready-made painting. He just had to transcribe it on the canvas and there was a beautiful landscape. You can imagine a couple of melting watches floating there and you've got your Dali masterpiece. He always sat down in this white armchair and had the canvas arranged on this structure in front of him. And this is really, really ingenious. It actually allows Dali to move the canvas up and down through the floor so he could paint on this vast scale. And you can see all of his paints and brushes, the details so precise and were so important to him that he had to use these tools, these very, very fine sable hair brushes to kind of get the effects that he needed. The combination of Gala's support and this wonderful location was a catalyst for Dali. Here, in the 1930s, he produced many of his most famous paintings. They have the classic Dali elements. The desolate landscapes, stark light, sharp shadows, mutated, displaced objects, and optical illusions. Here, a half-kneeling figure becomes a hand holding an egg. This is the grand entrance to Dali's house at Port Legat. In fact, this small space was the original fisherman's shack that he bought. So, first of all, this is the only bit that he lived in. Gradually, the whole place evolved and expanded outward like cellular growth. And in later years, when people came to meet them, well, you can see, they'd be met by this ferocious polar bear. Dali's surprisingly tasteful home is full of these unusual and unexpected objects. With the exotic stuffed animals, the giant eggs, weird sculptures, and sexually suggestive shapes, it's like walking into one of his paintings. But then Dali took surrealism far beyond just painting. It permeated every aspect of his life. In the 1930s, he was a pioneer of the surreal object. He would combine unusual and unlikely everyday things, which, when together, would become something absurd, yet strangely affecting. Most famously of all, he created the lobster telephone. One man who bought into Dali's surreal objects was the British patron Edward James. I've come to his Sussex mansion to meet art curator Ghislaine Wood and see some of the work that he commissioned. Hi, Ghislaine. Hi, Alistair. hi, Alistair. Hi. What a grand place. It is. It's amazing, isn't it? This is the, the vast country house of Edward James, who was a millionaire patron of Salvador Dali and lots of other surrealist artists, actually. And he was probably the most important patron of contemporary art in Britain in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and this was his parents' house, this vast country pile. Uh, but he didn't feel very comfortable here, so he actually moved into the hunting lodge in the grounds of West Dean, Monkton House and transformed it into this extraordinary surrealist environment. It's bright purple. It is. He covered the exterior in this incredible stucco and then painted it bright purple. It became a showcase house for Edward's collection of surrealist works. What he did was actually take Dali's ideas and then have them made by his decorating firm. W what sort of things? Well, the lip sofa, which is just over here, one of the most iconic objects well, created. This is possibly the sexiest sofa I've ever seen. 
It is. It's the Mae West Lip Sofa. I mean, it's a very playful piece. But if you want to take it further, it has all these other more disturbing, perhaps, meanings. Here we have the idea of fetishisation just completely embodied. Um, all sorts of very erotic and disturbing ideas, uh, but in a piece of sort of luxury interior design. Well, hang on a sec, because I'm looking at this and it looks like a very sumptuous pair of plump, juicy pink lips. You're saying this is dark and disturbing. Well, it is, because if you think about it, you sit in the mouth. As soon as um, you interact with this object, you're creating a dialogue between you and the object, which, of course, is um, what Dali was so brilliant at doing and what much contemporary art has, has, has explored later on. Um, but, of course, the idea is that you are being swallowed into this female mouth. But upstairs we can see another version, a one in red felt. Well, Edward James loved it so much that he got it repeated again he and did. again. And in fact, Edward had five made. Wow. It's incredible, yes. Um, Imagine having this at the foot of your bed. Can I just say that this is probably the most famous, one of the most famous things of the 20th century, and this is just in Edward James's bedroom. It actually was made as a working telephone. It's your ultimate surrealist composite object. What it does is it takes two completely disparate um, pre-existing things, a lobster and a telephone, puts them together and creates a fantastic new reality. But why do you think that this one has become so incredibly famous? It's a very simple idea, brilliantly done. Of course, there's this fantastic slippage between the shape of the receiver and the lobster, but also the idea of talking to a lobster is, of course, you know, a very witty and, and humorous thing. And I love this chair. This is obviously just a pun on armchair. Here. It is. And again, derived from an idea by Salvador Dali. These arms um, are really grasping for someone's bottom to come and sit on it. Well, indeed, or tickling your back, depending on, you know, how you, how you um, sit in it. But, I probably uh, just revealed too much about myself. Though. Well, indeed. I mean, that's the thing about Dali. It's all very subjective and personal. It's not just Edward James's home that's been shaped by Dali. Surrealism's playful and unexpected transformation of everyday objects has had a huge influence on interior design. One thing that Dali's surrealist objects teach us is that anything is possible. Why shouldn't a lobster or even a hamburger be a telephone? Or why can't you sit on an enormous orange dog in the privacy of your own home? One thing that Dali's introduced into the world of interior design is this sense of playfulness and wit and fun. I mean, look at this. This is a contemporary piece. It's a chair by the designer David Pomper. It's got these little silver legs. I just know that Dali would have loved this. This is really a latter-day surrealist object. By now, Dali's ambitions were limitless. And ever the provocateur, he wanted to preach the gospel of surrealism to as wide an audience as possible. And in the 30s, there was only one place in the world where he could really do that. New York. We all know that today's artists manipulate the way they're presented in the media. Everyone from Madonna and Tracy Emin to Lady Gaga play up to the cameras and understand the power of publicity. But in many ways, it was Dali who blazed a trail for them. When he arrived here in New York, the circus had come to town. New York became a showcase for Dali's work. He exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, designed shop windows on Fifth Avenue, and even made a surreal installation at the World's Fair. He called his creation the Dream of Venus, a pleasure dome filled with naked women and unfettered desire. The persistence of memory was unveiled in New York in 1932. It was originally bought for just $250, but the reaction to it and to Dali was immense. Dali once said, fame was as intoxicating to me as a spring morning, and here in America, he found fame like he'd never known it before. He loved it here. Ever the consummate showman, he quickly realised that America might just be his oyster, and soon enough, he was swept up in a frenzy of self-promotion. In 36, he appeared on the cover of Time magazine, which was a huge deal for a, an eccentric young Spanish artist who was barely into his 30s. The reporter at the time said that Dali had a faculty for publicity that should turn any circus press agent green with envy. And it was true. Dali